I welcome you all to the third day of the second international seminar on philosophy of education, organized by Azim Premdu University at Niyas, Bangalore. Good morning again. I request you all to put your mobile phones on switched off or silent mode. Thank you. Today's plenary session is titled, The Nature of Education Studies. There will be two papers presented in this session. One by Professor John Furlong, Professor of Educational Studies, University of Oxford, UK. Another one by Professor Rohit Dhankar, Asim Premdu University, Bangalore. The first paper is titled, The Discipline of Education, Rescuing the University Project. And the second paper is titled, Education Studies, Exploring the Possibility of an Adequate and Coherent Conception. The chair for this session would be Professor Milbury McLaughlin, Professor Emeritus, Graduate School of Education, Stanford University, USA. Everybody's here already, so I'm giving this over to the chair. Thank you. This is a wonderful day three plenary, I think, to be started because issues about the nature of an education discipline and what it is, its philosophical and practical and pragmatic roots have, at least for me, been threads that have run through um, our conversations over the last three days. So without further ado, Professor Furlong. Indeed, um, to the university for inviting me. I have to say, I find this an enormously stimulating conference, and I take my hat off to the organizers. Um, I'm really enthusiastic about what you're doing here. Okay, well, I want to talk a bit about what I call the discipline of education. Um, and it's a kind of a provocative title, and it's meant to be provocative, uh, that phrase discipline. Um, education is an immensely rich field. It covers every sector from early years to lifelong learning. It covers a vast range of topics from assessment to um, brain processes. It covers every single theory and every single methodology available in the social sciences and in the humanities as well. And given all of that huge variety, can we actually say that it's a discipline at all? Because it actually fails the first test of what a discipline perhaps should be which is that it actually have some kind of coherence and distinctiveness and rigor in terms of its epistemology. It fails that test. As educationalists, if we want that rigor, that discipline of the disciplines, what David Bridges calls the discipline of the disciplines, we tend necessarily go to the subdisciplines of sociology, psychology, and philosophy that we have here. So, are we a discipline? Well, I think there's more than one way of asking that question. We can ask questions of disciplines at an epistemological level. Questions about theory, about method, debates about the nature of evidence, how it's represented and defended. We can also ask about disciplines, we can ask questions about them sociologically. We can actually say to what extent they exist in conferences like this, do they exist in qualifications, in professorships, lectureships, learned societies, special, special editions of journals, they exist in all sorts of sociological ways as well. Um, and actually what Thomas Kuhn argues is that you actually need both of those. You need a secure institutional structure and then you need coherence of, of at an epistemological level for a discipline to move forward. But um, just staying with the epistemological questions, it's not my main focus this morning, but staying with those for a moment. Um, I think there's a really interesting history that um, kind of the German um, sociologist talks about when he looks at the rise of um, social sciences um, in the English-speaking world as opposed to uh, many continental countries in Europe. And actually says that throughout social sciences, and particularly as an example in education, there's always this attempt to make a contribution to the academy as well as to the world of practice. It's an unstable relationship. Our commitments are always about knowing that and knowing how. And that's a distinctively uh, English-American approach to the nature of social sciences, which kind of runs through and makes more complex um, the world that we actually inhabit. We also need to recognize epistemologically that there are multiple sources of knowledge and discourses about knowledge in our field. So you listen to debates about education, and we see, listen to see some people are invoking a liberal education conception, the idea of knowledge for its own sake, which is seen very important for personal development. Then we also see other people arguing for a disciplinary perspective, what you might call 
in an Aristotelian notion of episteme, the idea of science and um, analysis in a, in a systematic and rigorous way. There are other people in other dimensions talking about knowledge in a very practical sort of way. There's a hugely rich field that varies from a very simplistic notion of competences to very, very sophisticated interpretive notions of, say, no, mode to knowledge production. Th th there's a very, very rich field about tacit knowledge and how it works and the relationship between knowing how and knowing that that actually is a, a very different way of thinking about knowledge and is part of our debates. And another dimension of knowledge is actually a moral dimension as well. Certainly at times in history, the idea that it wasn't just about knowing how, but knowing the right way to act was absolutely critical to the field of education, particularly in the 19th century. And I think it's still there if you scratch the surface of most educational debates. We actually do, in a moral way, want to make a difference. So we have this amazing complexity in our field of topics, of epistemologies, of different sorts of knowledge. And given all this complexity, I mean, is it surprising then that our position as a field in the university sector is, is weak? In some ways, it's not at all surprising, it seems to me. But as I said, um, the epistemological questions are not ones I want to focus on particularly this morning, because I also, uh, as I said earlier, um, think that you can think about disciplines from a sociological point of view. You can think about the extent to which they exist as a social reality in conferences and lectureships and things like that. And one of the interesting things about taking a sociological perspective is that you can start to see this the advancement or the retraction of a field as a process of politics. It becomes a project that sometimes is moved forward, sometimes is knocked back, knocked back, and nowhere, I think, in the academy can you see this more clearly than in the field of education, which is, ha ha is constantly having to defend its boundaries, is constantly moving forward and moving backwards in a whole variety of complex ways. And that's the approach that I think underlines what I want to talk about when I'm talking about the idea of education as a discipline, looking at it as a political project. What that does is allow you to answer, ask all sorts of questions. So you can ask, ask, start to ask historical questions. So in the UK, as I think in India, we have a whole long history of a divided sector. We, have our normal, we had our normal colleges going right back to the early 19th century, which were very applied very driven by a moral principle, a religious principle, um, and really quite reductive in their outlook on what teaching was. And then from the 1890s, really, onwards, we start to get the universities, a small number of universities, getting involved in the field of education. It actually began slightly earlier than that um, in Manchester University in the 1860s. Um, they started to run evening classes for practicing teachers. And these were based on very different conceptions of knowledge. It was a very liberal education idea, not about applying anything that was applied. It was about educating the person in a broad and, and rounded way. So there's interesting debates that you have there, different conceptions. What I found interesting reading the history in my own country was how political that was in the 20th century. Right back at the beginning of the 20th century, we have teacher educators in the college sector wanting to move their field into the universities. So they were in charge of defining the curriculum, their pedagogy, in a whole variety of important ways. And the politics is interesting to read, where they were knocked back. So they, it was actually part of the Labour Party's manifesto to bring the teachers' colleges and combine them with universities in the 1920s. And then the teachers got involved in a national strike. And suddenly, the government took fright. The idea of the teachers' colleges coming into the universities where the government would have no longer any control over them was send alarm bells running everywhere, and that was pushed away for another generation. Same question arises after the war in the 1940s. Um, there was a review to say, what should we do with our teachers' colleges? It was called the McNair Report. Um, and that was chaired by um, a vice-chancellor. And the idea was being put on the agenda as a potential thing for the government saying, why don't you combine this as a single system? This time it was the vice chancellors who ran scared. The idea of having this very applied field interfering with their elite, pure research-based knowledge was something they simply didn't want to get involved with. And again, the teachers' colleges were kept right out here. You can start to see 
the sense of politics about forms of knowledge and the development of the discipline in a very powerful way. So there's a very interesting history there. There's also histories about um, uh, research in the field, which I don't have time to go into. This is not just a history lesson. It is important because the big change in, in the UK came in 1963 with the Robbins Report. It was a report inquiry into the whole of higher education. And one of the things they took a whole section on is to look at teacher education and the field of education as a, as a discipline. And they argued for the first time that teaching had to be a, a graduate profession. You had to invent the idea of a degree in education for the first time. And R.S. Peters was absolutely critical in this process. Shortly after the Robbins report came out, he was asked to convene a confidential and closed conference at Hull University, where senior academics and government officials came together to hammer out what a degree would look like in education. And the answer, and the answer was that it had to contain large amounts of sociology, psychology, philosophy, and history. Interestingly, at the beginning of the meeting, R.S. Peters didn't think history was going to be there. He thought it was going to be economics. At the end of the meeting, they decided it was history. And economics has never found a serious place in the discipline of education ever since that date. Also, very significantly for the development of our field, they never even considered having pedagogy as a core part of, the, of, of what it was that constituted our field. What is interesting is those ideas found their way throughout the, English, the British Commonwealth. You go to any field in, you go to India, you go to Australia, you go to Malta, you go to Malaysia, you scratch the surface and you start in the field of education and you see those ideas still there constituting what it is our very being is and how we are conceptualised. Of course it's changed and developed in many ways over the years but it is still very significantly there. And that move became a huge impetus to different forms of research, which had, up at that time had been very narrowly conceived in psychological terms and testing and measurement and intelligence. The other thing the Robbins report did was said that if you're going to get teachers' colleges running degrees, they had to be proper institutions at higher education level. They have to be independent and autonomous and run their own curriculum. He didn't realise it was going to take another 30 to 40 years for that to happen. But it um, did slowly happen, and after 1992 in the UK, um, we start to have a properly unified system where the mass of teacher education comes into the university sector, something that hasn't happened in India yet, of course. So today we've got 112 departments of education around the country, and they're actually what's interesting if you go around them all is that they do kind of feel very different, because as institutions they have different histories, different lived realities for students and for teachers as well who work in them, depending on whether they come from the old university sector, whether they come from a research elite institution, or whether they come from the new university sector, or made up of some kind of combination of teachers' colleges as well. They are really, really interestingly different to spend time going around. I want to argue that today the education project um, is in jeopardy, and it's in, in jeopardy for a whole variety of reasons. I can only just talk very, to, to point very briefly to the latest manifestation of those challenges to our field, pushing us back all the time. The, the, the Robbins report was a big push forward. We come back to the modern period, there's a real push back in the, in the UK, and I think internationally as well, in many areas as well. I mean, the most specific thing that's going on in, in, in England at the moment is the idea of um, what's called school direct. Um, that's where money for teacher education is put into schools, rather than universities, and the universities, the, the schools decide what it is they want to buy from the universities. So it's a market-based system. Um, and it's destabilizing um, teacher education in a very profound way. Um, and uh, two of our most research productive universities have this year left the system, left to teach education entirely, and others are considering their position. So it's a, it's a very important turning point. But there are lots of other things. It's not just that. There's a a whole raft of measures in the UK and in many, and, and very strongly in parts of the states, which is really trying to challenge um, the position of education. Well, why are we in this crisis? I want to argue that there are two answers um, here that I just want to, to allude to very briefly. And they both start to happen 
at the end of the 20th century. One is concerned with the changing nature of universities themselves and the impact of neoliberalism on them and the emergence of what I would call the, the enterprise university. And the other thing that was happening exactly at the same time was I think I want to talk about a collapse of certainty of knowledge that's very, very important, that's undermined um, many fields in higher education in quite important ways. And the big thing about what's been happening in the late 20th century was this massification of higher education, this huge expansion that's actually happened all over the world. And it's been not been matched by appropriate funding that goes with it. So inside the UK, um, we've started to become extremely selective about where research money goes. We have a, a research assessment exercise that goes on all the time, one going on at the moment. Um, the government passed an act of parliament in 2004 saying that research wasn't a necessary part of universities. You could have teaching only universities. Um, that was very, very controversial. Um, at the same time, governments have started to see that universities are part of their global project for, and they fund certain sorts of research. They see it as part of their marketing ability um, internationally. If you write, do the right sorts of research, if you use the methodologies um, and the strategies that, are, that are, are supported by government agencies themselves. What you get in those circumstances then is the emergence of the enterprise university. If you are a dean, if you are a vice chancellor, and if you're not entrepreneurial, if you're not chasing where the money, are, money is, the students are, the new courses are, if you're not doing that, if you're not fleet of foot, you're going to go down. You have to become highly entrepreneurial. And that's part of the nature of our universities, not just in the UK, but in very many countries around the world. They're highly entrepreneurial institutions. So that's one thing that was happening at the end of the 20th century. Just as education was fully coming in to the university sector, universities themselves were changing quite profoundly. The other thing that's going on is what I call the collapse of certainty. I could just get at this most effectively by reading you this very brief quote from Ron Barnett. He says, The idea of objective knowledge is central to higher education, but from various theoretical quarters, philosophy of science, sociology of knowledge epistemology, critical theory, post-structuralism, the idea of objective knowledge and truth has come under massive assault. What, if anything, is to replace it? objective knowledge is unclear. Pragmatism, relativism, metacriticism, even anything goes. They're all proposed. The very diversity of alternative options is testimony to the collapse of some of our basic epistemological tenets. I don't think any of us can underestimate the significance of the change that's happened in the university's relationship to knowledge over the last 20 to 30 years. The idea that somehow there is some confident view of certain knowledge that universities have and others don't have, particularly in an applied field like education. That certainty has been profoundly undermined, profoundly undermined. And I think there's no going back from that. That, I think, has three major consequences. These two things, as I said, were happening just as, as education was becoming a fully-fledged fully discipline in, in the UK and in many other parts of the world. It allows the government to be incredibly assertive about what it wants and what it's going to pay for. Because the universities themselves are strapped for cash, they have to do what their masters are saying, and also because there's that lack of confidence. It's much more difficult for universities to stand up and say, I know these things, I can do these things, this is distinctively us. Very hard to do that in this modern world. It has also encouraged um, universities to become very entrepreneurial. And so universities like my own, they pursue international students, they become more and more successful at it, more and more successful at getting international grants and national grants. And what that does is distinguish the system, it separates the system. Some become more successful, some much less successful in terms of their finance and their independence. And then in all of that world, the field of teacher education becomes pretty marginalised, becomes downgraded, becomes second, of secondary importance. So I think the end of the 20th century was a really, really important time for universities internationally, the whole of the university sector. It was a particularly important time for our field, which was finding its feet properly as a discipline in the university sector for the first time, I would argue. So our crisis is after 100 years of trying to get into the university sector properly, um, we're now overwhelmingly in the university sector in the UK, 
But too much of what we do and too much of what we teach and what we research is kind of not really of it, too much of it. So, rescuing the university project. Five challenges, five steps. I think the first thing, and of course my evidence here is about the UK, but I would commend any education system in here, in India or anywhere else to start to do the same sort of thing, is really facing up to the reality of who you are and where you are at the moment. So, for example, the work I do in the, in, in, in the UK, I find out we've got 5,200 academic staff working in the field of education. I collected lots of sorts of data, but you, the significant ones are that 34% of them are on, on teaching only contracts. That's the highest proportion of any discipline in higher education in the UK. Only 27% of them have doctorates. That's the lowest proportion of any discipline in the UK. And what you actually have is a segmented labour force. You have a smaller number of high qualified uh, staff on very secure contracts, and then you have a much larger number of staff on, with lower qualifications on, on part-time and casual contracts. It's just one of the realities of the world I just think we have to face up to in my country, and I suspect pretty similar patterns happen elsewhere. Another thing is getting coming to terms with their own teaching, and it has strengths and weaknesses. We are certainly, um, you know, the inspection reports, governments inspect what we do. The reports are always very good. Our students give us very good feedback. They get very good jobs. But on the other hand, if you look at the other side of it, a lot of our teaching is very, very um, uh, practice-oriented in a very narrow sense uh, after 25 years of what I would call the turn to the practical. And that has very great implications for staffing, to staff our departments of education, you want people to come straight in from school who've got lots of school experience. They bring with them their own research interests necessarily, but it also then tends to make you very different from other faculties in the university, which it becomes a problem in some ways. So there are some interesting questions about where we are in terms of our teaching. There are interesting questions about research, about what the balance sheet looks like there. We do produce in the UK some really outstanding research as good as any social science department in the UK. Um, and some of our best work um, uh, would compares extremely well um, internationally on huge numbers of international benchmarking. So there are established universities with really strong research profiles. On the other side, considering the size of our field, which is um, the second largest social science in the UK, we're pretty weak. Um, we um, bring people straight out of school to work in faculties of education, and then we're lousy at helping them develop the skills to become researchers. That's why so many of them end up on teaching only contracts. The quality of our work is also immensely variable. Some of it's brilliant, and lots of it is pretty mediocre. And we use a very narrow range of research methods as well. Um, so there's a, a whole range of different questions on positive and, and negative sides. And what I'm saying is, the work that I've been doing is trying to, trying to face up to some of that stuff, trying to look at what's out in my field, bring it together, and say, let's have a, a, an objective assessment about where we are. And I would strongly commend other systems to do the same sort of thing. So the overall diagnosis is that we have a very segmented field in the UK, segmented in terms of institutions, staffing, teaching, research, and significantly, we're often isolated from other disciplines, and in many respects, because of government intervention, not in charge of ourselves anymore. So that's my first step, facing up to where we are. Second step, second challenge, second answer. Being clear about what a university is. One of the things that's happened a lot in these challenging times that we have in the UK is that people say, um, well, we're good at what we do. You know, the government reports like us, our inspection, um, reports are good, our students get good jobs. What, when we've been challenged, what my field has done, has hit, here's Jeremy Bentham here. That actually is Jeremy Bentham. He's um, mummified in University College London. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm serious. But you, all you get is utilitarian arguments. And there's virtually nobody saying universities ought to be involved in this field because they have something distinctively significant to contribute. That argument has not been put forward. Arguments are only put forward in terms of efficiency, in utilitarian terms. And I think it's really, really important to start to sort out 
what it is that's distinctive that universities might offer to a field like education. So it makes you ask the question, well, what's a university for in the first place? Not an easy question to answer. Um, but if you want to know the idea of an education, I guess the, the best place to start is with John Newman's famous series of theses on, on the idea of a university. Of course, his argument was only concerned with um, elite education for undergraduates, but he was very concerned with education as a personal form of enrichment. He was totally against the idea of vocational education. He actually argues that it's actually mental culture that's the most important and significant thing that's useful not actually teaching useful things in a direct sense. But that idea that education is about, universities are about the promotion of liberal education is a core idea that actually is still there and you can hear it in the public discourse. But there are lots of other discourses around now about what universities are for. So you can hear those debates from a liberal education point of view, but you can also hear debates from a Humboldtian tradition, the idea that universities should focus on narrow research, that the heart of a university is the research professor working with his or her small number of um, graduate students, um, probably unable to talk to the um, person in the room next door because they're so specialised, let alone the person in, across the other side of the campus. A different voice you hear in the debates about what universities for is the idea of professional education of elite professions. That's actually an idea that goes right back to the European medieval university with the education of doctors, the education of lawyers, the education of theologians. And those arguments are still there in a very important elite sort of way. It's rather different from professional education as we know it, those arguments. And then you have arguments going back to David Hume in Scotland, the idea that universities should be a civic institutions, out and engaged with the real world, um, actually producing research and courses that are accessible and useful. All of those discourses about what universities are for are out there. They, if you go into any senior common room, you will hear them being talked about and articulated by colleagues at the same time. So we have this amazing multi-voiced institution that actually seems to be doing a whole range of different sorts of things. So is the idea of a university, given all that complexity nowadays, is that possible to have still an idea I like Sheldon Rothblatt's work. He's an American historian of higher education. And he says, however elusive the idea of a university, the conception of a basic thrust is a relief, an attractive alternative to the relativistic and uninspiring description of the contemporary university as one-stop shopping. I still think I'm certainly attracted by the idea of the idea that there is an idea. There's something distinctive that we're doing. I'm still very attracted by that idea. But I think following that quotation that I gave you from Ron Barnett, I think you can't find the answer in knowledge itself anymore. I think the bolt has been shot. No, we, don't have, we don't exclusively own certain forms of knowledge anymore. Many institutions are, in, are, are knowledge generating institutions nowadays, not just universities. And anyway, our confidence that we know something that is true has also been undermined. But there is something that still exists, I think. There's, and that, and trying to capture it in a phrase is very hard. But I talk about, there is something about a process. There's something about a journey. Something you might characterise as the maximisation of reason or the contestability of knowledge. The contestability of knowledge actually seems to me to kind of have it. It kind of goes to the heart of what our research is and what our teaching is. The idea that we should be contesting things and debating things with ourselves and with our students seems to be powerfully important. And it's not that other institutions don't do this. Um, school systems do this. Um, industry does this. But this, they're not essentially about that. This is something I believe is actually essential to what university is about, at the heart of what it's about. Now, as philosophers, you're going to tell me off for that being an essentialist argument, and therefore narrow and reductive. I would remind you that I'm involved in a political process here. I'm trying to find something that I actually do believe in that actually can be a vehicle that actually can help us move forward in the public debate about what universities are doing and what our role is in them. Other people are doing that, arguing, um, particularly in relation to the humanities. So Martha Nassbaum, um, Stefan Collini from um, 
uh, the UK and other people have written uh, powerfully about the defence of humanities in the modern university. It's got to maintain this commitment to the contestability of knowledge. And they argue that humanities are special in society, have a special place in society, because they're part of our culture where these sorts of skills and ways of thinking are supported and developed. I think we have to win that argument, not just for something special like humanities. I believe those, that approach to knowledge is just as central to a vocational field like education as it is to humanities. Anyone going through university to doing anything, it seems to me, has the right to take part in an educative process that's based on the principles of the contestability of knowledge. So, getting clear what we're about, that was step two. Step three, retooling for professional education. I've got a series of now I know where we are, what does that mean about our processes? Is professional education still the core of what we do? I do believe it is, but trying to characterise what it is we've got is hard. So Eric Hoyle talks about what we give is extended professionality to the profession. Cochrane Smith talks about expanded professionalism. Paul Hurst says what the universities are about is being exposed to the best that's been thought and said about education and um, developing practical theories in education as well. So people have been trying to grapple with, given the vision of, of universities that I've been talking about, what it is that that's going to be giving to, to um, the teaching profession and um, more broad, in a broad sense. I think if you're going to do that, you have to ask, well, why do teachers, why does the teaching profession need that extended professionality that we can offer? I can give you a liberal educational answer. It doesn't cut much ice with governments. Um, but a liberal education answer would be that the kids we are educating are going out into this amazingly complex world where the technology is changing, where knowledge is exploding, when society itself is changing in so many different sorts of ways with a huge mobility of values and culture and conflict. And in those circumstances, kids themselves need to know how to make judgments. They need to know how to assess evidence. They need to know how to reach their own conclusions. And if the kids need that, then absolutely the teaching force needs that as part of its educative, educative process. Now, I personally firmly believe those things. I suspect that my own government will be deeply sceptical about them. Those arguments are why you need, why teachers need this critical dimension. So you can give a neoliberal answer instead, and that is because it works. And this is what I've been spending my last year doing. Um, I don't have time to talk about this stuff in, in any detail at all. But I've been part of um, the British Educational Research Association has come together with the Royal Society of Arts uh, in, a, in, a, in an inquiry that I've chaired. And this is the report which comes out on Friday, the final report comes out on Friday. And we've wanted to know what the evidence is that if you engage the teaching profession in teacher education with forms of theory and forms of research in different ways, that that actually has a beneficial effect on them and their professional development, and what is the evidence that it has an impact on young people themselves? What is the evidence? Um, the way we've worked um, is that we commissioned seven expert papers, um, including um, one from someone in this hall. Um, uh, and we also called for submissions. We had meetings across, across the U four countries of the UK. We had a reference group made up of teachers' unions, learning societies. We did our work to actually make sure this stuff actually is engaged very broadly across the whole of the UK. Um, and the biggest part of that is the seven papers. Um, we have a couple of them that are actually looking at where research relates to teacher education in the UK and internationally. The international one is very, is very, very powerful in looking at where research-informed teacher education fits in highly successful school systems in, in Finland, in Singapore, in Shanghai, in a variety of well-known places, all of which have forms of teacher education where research is a core part of what they do. Um, we then um, uh, looked at um, the philosophical arguments. Sorry to harness this to a utilitarian point of view, from a neoliberalist point of view, but we, we wanted to know what the arguments were in principle that research is part of professional learning, professional development. Very, very powerful paper. 
And then we want to look at the empirical evidence. What is the evidence that if you get research-informed initial teacher education or continuing professional development or school improvement, is there international evidence that that makes a difference? The stuff in initial teacher education is not as robust. It's in good pockets around the world of small studies that show that it does make a difference. Um, the research um, internationally on continuing professional development is very powerful indeed. There are ways of working where we draw, draw, join teachers to research processes that you can actually measure the impact in good old PISA terms. You can measure the impact on the teacher's learning and on the outcomes for the kids. Um, and, uh, and you can do the same in certain small communities, um, areas where, where whole systems of school improvement have done the same sort of thing. So there really is robust evidence out there, which is really, really important, and it's part of our final report. And that's part of uh, providing a, a one dimension of an answer, one dimension of an answer, to try to advance the project of education. And it's taking the government, our government, in its own terms, which is neoliberal liberal terms, and saying, does this stuff work? And there's pretty strong evidence that it does. Step four. Retooling for knowledge mobilization. Um, so most of my professional career as, a, as an educational researcher, of course, as well as a teacher. In the UK, we spend about £80 million a year. And the dominant rationale of people like myself is that we want to make a difference. That's how we do it. But actually, the impact of what we do is really hard to show. Um, and that makes us low status in two terms. We're often low status in our universities because we're very applied. That doesn't help us in the pecking order in our university. And then we're often low status for governments because we can't actually show that what we've done makes any difference anyway. And they're asking, they want applied fields. And it's actually very hard to show this stuff. And so I think, I mean, I was very interested by Carol Weiss and her work, um, sociologist of knowledge from the States, and she argues that it takes about 25 years for research to start to have an impact in a field. She has this lovely phrase called knowledge creep. I don't think we've got 25 years, not in the worlds that we live in. We've got to find much better ways than we have at the moment of mobilising the knowledge that we have from our academy if we're going to be take, continue to be taken seriously. And there's a whole range of different strategies one can use for knowledge mobilisation. There are you know, well-established forms of action research with practitioners, we can get uh, users involved in the design of projects and engaging with projects. We can get knowledge brokers. One of the things that's been fascinating by the project I've done this year, working with the Royal Society of Arts, they're a think tank, highly respectable, been there for 200 years. They forced us from day one to say, there was me saying, what's the evidence, what's the evidence, what's the evidence? They're saying, what's your influencing plan? What's your influencing plan? What's your influencing plan? putting that right at the heart of what we do. That was a powerful learning experience for me, and we all need to do much more of that stuff. We also need to think about new sorts of institutions as well that are perhaps standing halfway between the world of practice and the world of universities. I can think of some examples, but I don't have time to talk about them. There's a whole variety of strategies for knowledge mobilisation we need to get into. The last one, retooling for research. We've got to get, continue to get better. I told you that in the UK we have excellent res educational research, but that's only a small proportion of what we do. We have lots of it that's nowhere near good enough. We've got to continue a broad-braced range of research methods, particularly quantitative research methods. And we've got to open up our research to other disciplines. When I started as a teacher educator, I would regularly go to sociology conferences um, outside my field. Um, that would be most unusual nowadays. We've become more closed in our own area of work in the field of education, and that's not healthy for us. We've also got to recognise that we've got to broaden our research agenda. There are educational questions around all of these big, big issues around social change, equality, religion, poverty, the economy. There are educational dimensions to those questions, and our countries are asking those questions, but we're not necessarily being encouraged to get involved in those debates ourselves. I think the research agenda is changing. It's been, been driven by international organisations such as the OECD and by in, in Europe, by the European Union, where there is a real focus on interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches to research questions in relation to the big issues 
And unless we can get ourselves as educationalists involved in those debates, then someone else as an economist will answer the educational questions for us. And we've got to get out of our small world and get into those big debates. There's a real challenge for us there. Finally, in terms of research, we've got to recognise, and this is for deans here, recognising that it's absolutely central to the university project. Because the only if our faculties of education have a strong research culture based on however you want to characterise it, based on the contestability of knowledge, the maximisation of reason, my little catchphrases to try and capture that. Only if you've got that at the heart of what you do can you actually justify your existence as beings having something distinctive to contribute. Um, it's if when we're taking, when teaching, core teaching is undertaken by people who are casualised, who are excluded from that research-based culture, and that's happened hugely, particularly in England, then you actually undermine your right to actually claim for something distinctive. I'll just conclude by this little um, quote from Robert Persig. He says, the real university is a state of mind. It's that great heritage of rational thought that's been brought down to us through centuries, which doesn't exist in any specific location. It's a state of mind which is generated throughout the centuries by a body of people who traditionally carry the title of lecturer, or professor. But even that title is not part of the real university. The real university is nothing less than the continuing body of reason itself. Okay, some follow-up reading, particularly the uh, website for the latest report from the Beera and RSA inquiry that's important for you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Furlong. We have a little more, about 15 minutes for questions. Um, are there questions? Yes. Here? Uh, we prefer one at a time. Here, so. So, I'd like to, your considerations with regard to education as a university subject or university program very much. But still, the question is whether education is a discipline or rather a multidisciplinary field. This is the question on the research level, on the level of scientific organization, and so on and so on. And uh, from, uh, a prospect, from the perspective of the philosophy of education, it is uh, really important not to understand education as a discipline, but as a multidisciplinary field. Why is that so important? Because otherwise, uh, uh, you are going to uh, define philosophy of education, or sociology of education, or history of education as a kind of sub-disciplines of a constructed uh, over-discipline of education, which leads to isolation from, in the case of philosophy of education, from the philosophy of mainstream philosophy. So, uh, philosophy of education is going to become some kind of eclectic mixture, a little bit pop philosophy, a little bit history, a little bit, uh, I don't know why, uh, economy and so on, political science, political science and so on. And this is not precisely what helps the recognition of uh, this field, of uh, this discipline of philosophy of education, like uh, the same is, I think, with okay. history of education and so on and so on. Yeah. So what would be the strategy? So the better one would be to understand education as a multidisciplinary field, I think, in order to get a better recognition for, the, for this entire field. Well, to, um, to I, think part of your question, uh, I think part of your question needs to be addressed um, after uh, our next speaker, who's going to be to try and to defend um, education, uh, to look at education I I I as a multidisciplinary field uh, from a epistemological point of view. Um, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I'm just, what I, what I am saying, though, um, is that uh, I use the phrase discipline, I said provocatively. I use it politically. And I'm not ashamed to say that unless some of us get engaged in this politics, there won't be the spaces left around, certainly in the UK, for people like ourselves here to be gathering together to pursue our own important interests. It's part of that bigger politics. So I take what your point, your point is, and I'm very happy for you to pursue it. But I think there is a bigger political issue that some in the academy need to get engaged in. 
with actually defending the core enterprise itself. So, Next question. Yeah, Heinz. Um, I think we might have to think counterintuitively about this. Um, there's a possibility that the university suffers from trying to do too much uh, to academize all forms of social practice. Education is um, episteme, techne, and phronesis, uh, you know, based on science, but it's a practical wisdom field, which is, by the way, something I will talk about in my talk. Thank you for setting it up. Um, and we are treating education as a science um, when we do all of the teacher education activities under the roof of the university. That doesn't have to be the case. There's a role for a master teacher um, who is a craftsman, um, and we need to stop trying to do the entire range of things. Yeah, I, uh, thanks, Heinz. Yeah, um, in trying to squash this stuff in, um, I've really, uh, and I think of a particular audience here, then um, I uh, can see why you might have taken the idea that I thought that, that the universities were supreme. In, um, in whole areas of professional education, profoundly they're not, absolutely profoundly they're not. That absolutely goes to the core of what my being is. Um, it's about trying to work out how universities engage with the world of practice and contribute. And sometimes it's contributing only very little, and sometimes it's contributing a huge amount. One of the things that you will get if you look at those that um, uh, report from the British Educational Research Association and the Royal Society of Arts is actually it's putting those ideas absolutely at the center it's actually not saying that somehow teachers' heads need to be filled up with research. It's not it's seeing this as a tool, a tool they bring to their own practice and the heart of what they're doing is their, is their phronesis, is, their, is, is the, the practical wisdom that they need to develop. So I, I just help, thank you for helping me get that said in a very, very, very clear way. Thank you. Um, another question? Yes, over here. I was feeling that your reliance on the concept of reason as the major reason to be in the university is not adequate because I think a lot of the new knowledge enterprises that emerge are emerging which are actually driving research and the um, production of knowledge being linked to practice is actually happening outside the university. I feel the more core concept of the university is the ability not to be conservative about how you approach the idea of reason itself and what you claim as science. Yeah. And I think if we just rely on reason alone, we will no. actually allow these new knowledge enterprises yeah. to... Well, there's two questions there. Um, certainly, there are some very exciting... Um, when I talked about we need, new, we need new institutional structures that move outside the university and interface with the world of practice in different sorts of ways, I was thinking about innovative research institutes, and I believe you're working for one at the moment. And they're, and they're powerful, and we need to take account of those. The question, of, of, of course, about reason um, is I'm not implying by that a narrow scientific notion. I think um, in, there are multiple versions of reason. It, I'm talking about disciplined, disciplined thought, and, the, and one can have those within the humanities, the humanities, humanities tradition as well as in the hard science tradition and everything in between. So it's about disciplined thought that actually is part of a particular historical canon about how one goes about thinking. I'm certainly not implying that it's narrow and scientific. Lessons uh, are there from, say, the field of medicine, which, which is a, a field of, of practice, you know, phronesis, techne, and so on. I think that origins, you know, pe people learn to be doctors in hospitals before maybe they move to the universities and so on. Is, I mean, medicine is accepted in the academy. What, what lessons, why would medicine set up credibility, say, in a UK university and, and, and teaching, which is fundamentally maybe of the same order, um, be under threat? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. And I don't actually know the answer to why. Um, it manages to maintain its um, position. Um, because if you actually want to ask who has the greatest importance in society, yes, we all get worried about our health, but actually thinking about the education of the next generation is actually even more important than my personal health. 
Um, so I, I don't really quite understand it, but I do think the question about how different we are in terms of education is a very, very important one. One of the things about, and there are lots of debates in education, in teacher education, whether we should be borrowing medical models, whether we should be talking about clinical practice. One of the distinctive things about um, medical practice, when you're a, doctor, a young doctor going on the wards to learn your trade, you've already had three years of a science degree, a, med a medical degree. You're entering a culture where... Uh, where um, the, um, uh, the registrar you're working with, where the consultant you're working with, even the senior nurses that you're working with are all, all part of a research culture. They're reading. So when, it, when they're talking practically about what to do with that patient in that bed, part of their everyday practical knowledge is also an awareness of what the latest research findings um, have. We profoundly don't have that in education. When you get uh, teachers themselves involved in their important part of the professional educational process, what they're drawing on is a common, a common sense uh, idea that's actually practised in, in their particular school. Um, so when we, do it in, when we do that sort of work in education, and I'm a great believer in, in schools taking huge responsibility for teacher education themselves, but we have to find ways of actually then bringing in other sorts of knowledge. Knowledge about what happens in practice elsewhere, in other classrooms, in other schools. Knowledge of from, that comes from research and comes from theory. And we have to have, uh, and people have been experimenting around the world with a whole variety of different ways. But it's about, it's because the school system itself is not imbued in its everyday practice with research, that you have to really work hard to get that stuff in if you want to put practice itself at the heart of what you're doing. We have two last questions, one there and one there. Uh, I have two questions. Um, I think I have oh, two right. questions. Yes. Uh, the first one is regarding your uh, fifth, uh, I mean the fifth point on continuing to retool research. I was wondering why you would recommend more uh, quantitative research while I thought your whole arguments were towards making it more liberal and less instrumentalist. So that's one. Uh, two, I would like to know if I got your uh, earlier slides right, um, you'd mentioned somewhere education as an applied discipline. So I would like to know about that because if I extend that argument to teacher education as an applied discipline, it's been quite problematic to be looking at it. Okay. So I would like to know your right. views. Uh, well, that one I can't answer because I use the phrase fairly sloppily and, and perhaps over coffee you can um, tell me what's wrong with using the phrase applied discipline. Um, so I can't really answer that one. The first one, well if I was to be born again as an educational researcher um, I, I would certainly do an undergraduate degree in philosophy um, and then I would do a master's degree in statistics. Um, and I say that as, a, um, as, as an evangelical qualitative researcher for most of my life. But I find um, the, it's to do with the power, and it's not necessarily to do with the epistemology, it's to do with the power of, of statistics in our contemporary society. That as an educational researcher, if you are not competent to really judge the quality of statistically based arguments, then you are always fighting your corner with something behind, with your hand tied behind your back, it seems to me. And I think everyone who is engaging in public debate on education just simply part of their general education needs to be much more competent than my generation has been. So that's my argument to that. And the last question. Hi. Hi. Um, my question concerns, uh, say, this focus of interdisciplinarity. I mean, of course, I suppose it's a good thing. But um, I have uh, now that sometimes talking about interdisciplinarity with regard to humanities, uh, might actually be a problem for the man itself. So I'll just give you an example. In the last Horizon 2020 European program, uh, there is a strong tendency to, um, say, fund pro humanities projects within actually larger projects of you know, social sciences, maybe even actually natural sciences. And so the idea would be that the only way humanities can be funded is only if we, you know, there are projects, multi or interdisciplinary projects, when there's also a part of humanity, say philosophy, for instance. Now, the idea there is actually then you have, you know, philosophy, for instance, my discipline is a quite ancillary, so to speak. It's just part of larger projects, which, you know, are just, you know, the, the, the focus of what is then being funded. 
And it seems to me that in that sense is becoming, uh, you know, this human, you know, humanism becoming in that sense and actually not the real focus of what will be just founded. Now, don't you see this as a problem? Uh, well, I think, I think, uh, I can't actually answer your question very particularly, but I think, um, I think interdisciplinary research and multidisciplinary research is a huge problem. I think it's immensely difficult to do. And it's immensely difficult to maintain um, one's position, one's integrity, um, in terms of the intellectual traditions that you have you're bringing together. And it's a very, very skilled leader of such programs who can bring those together so that you can actually um, have the opportunity to do something that's genuine for your own discipline as well as reaching out. And I suspect that's why many of the big projects tend to be um, run with economics as in the lead because economics feels it can talk to any field. It feels it can do that. It feels it can do it quite legitimately and actually silence so many of those complexities. So my argument, again, I'm afraid, is a political one, that that is where the politics is, the politics of inter interdisciplinary research that makes a difference. And we have to find ways of getting in the corner and arguing for our corner that there are more complex ways of thinking about educational processes than the economists give credit for, that there are different intellectual traditions that we can bring to it. But it's actually very, very hard. I've done some of this work, and I've found it immensely challenging, I have to say, but also a good learning experience. Thank and the very, very last question. Ah, one more? One more. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, just a brief comment and then a question. I think it's quite instructive to compare uh, similar interdisciplinary applied uh, areas, if you like, like engineering or medicine. And uh, if you look at that, I think that, uh, for instance, the way engineering or medicine organizes interdisciplinary input is quite different, I think, from the way you're proposing that education organizes its interdisciplinary input. For instance, in engineering, if you have inputs from mathematics or physics, and in medicine, from physiology, biochemistry, microbiology, I think essentially you're looking uh, for inputs which are quite limited which are in terms of specific uh, bodies of knowledge, specific concepts or tools that you might later on use in either engineering or medicine. However, it seems to me that in education, what you want to, what you're asking for is something much larger. You want to, you know, you want them to be, to reflect critically on society using the tools and arguments and uh, reasoning processes from sociology. You want them to do, you know, reflect critically you know, using the philosophical mode of uh, argument and discourse. I think this is perhaps asking for too much, especially in terms of uh, teacher education. That's uh, one question. The other thing is also that medicine and engineering, the way they organize practice, the institutions of practice, are themselves have been restructured. I think particularly medicine. Medicine has become a very diverse field Practice itself is specialized and differentiated. Well, that's not the case with education. I think maybe this is... No, that's, that last point is a very good point, um, because we are generalists. Um, now, I would... The, 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 fir the first point, I, I'm not arguing that, that um, say, part of an undergraduate degree in education or a master's degree in education should not include significant amounts of, of philosophy, for example. I'm not arguing that. But when it comes to the world of practice itself, of, of teachers uh, being rooted in their own classrooms or leaders of schools being rooted in their own schools, when they want to look at resources of what can actually help them ask their own practical questions in a harder way, then I think they actually have to be able to reach across a whole variety of different resources, intellectual resources. They're not becoming philosophers. They're becoming classroom practitioners. They are in, involved in their own classroom and they need to be able to be working with people outside who can actually bring a whole range of intellectual resources for them. So it's not to say that part of their personal education might be much more specialised than that. But the, tr the, 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 the trouble with, you know, with any practical field, and education is a good example, is that the practical problems that we face do not tie themselves together very neatly into bundles of being psychology or sociology or philosophy. They're much more messy, they're much more complex than that. And if you want to be able to use the resources of the academy, then you actually need to be able to search across its, its resources and work with someone who can broker those experiences for you and help you to use them in, with you at the centre of it.
So there's two processes going on here, and I think maybe we're confusing the two. Okay, I've Thank had you. my hour. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Dunkar will explore the possibility of an adequate and coherent conception. So a response.